The ancient and highly advanced Vedic civilization that existed in what is now called India possesses extraordinary knowledge about the nature of reality. In the Rig Veda and other ancient texts, there is a description of cycles of time called yugas. There are said to be four of these yugas, and depending on what text you are looking at, you're going to come to a different conclusion as to the specifics of them. This is why there is some confusion and debate over when the yugas are beginning and ending and when the Kali Yuga cycle is ending. I have found three major methods that have been used to calculate the yugas and I will share with you the third method being the one that I believe is the most accurate. Just for comparison's sake, I will go through all three so you can see the differences between them. So overall, each method acknowledges that there are four different yugas within the complete yuga cycle. The first is the Krita or Satya Yuga which is the so-called golden age. And then when there is a descent, we go down into the Treta Yuga. And then after that, the Dvapara Yuga. And then finally, the Kali Yuga, which is the very bottom of the Yuga cycle. I'm gonna go through the method that seems the most outlandish and you'll see why. According to this one, which is not the original way of calculating the yugas, which is important to understand, the Krita or Satya Yuga is 1,728,000 earth years and 4,800 divine years. Overall, this yuga is four times longer than the Kali Yuga, according to this method of counting. After that, you have the Treta Yuga, which is 1,296,000 earth years, or 3,600, quote, divine years. And it is said to be three times longer than the Kali Yuga. After that, you have the Dvapada Yuga, which is 864,000 earth years or 2,400 divine years, making it two times longer than the Kali Yuga. And then finally, the Kali Yuga is measured according to this method as being 432,000 earth years or 1,200 divine years. So as you see, there is a diminishing way of counting the yugas. The Golden Age Yuga, the Satya Yuga, is four times longer than the Kali Yuga. Treta, three times longer. Vapara, two times longer. Four, three, two, one. And obviously these outlandishly long amounts of time for these yugas mean that basically humanity, human beings, homo sapiens sapiens, through their entire existence, have been within a Kali Yuga, which is, in my opinion, preposterous. And there's many reasons that we can go into as to why this sort of extremely long count was created in the first place. But for right now, let's just go over more aspects of the Yuga cycles to understand them better. And we'll keep going with this really ridiculously long one. So to further understand these cycles, it's important to understand that there are both dawn and dusk periods for each age. These are considered to be times of transition. Each age, each yuga, has a dawn and a dusk of 400 divine years each within this first method of counting. For example, that means that the core and quote worst of the Kali Yuga only lasts for 400 divine years, which is still 144,000 of our Earth years. As we progress through the Yuga cycle and go through each of the four Yugas, human consciousness 
and you can expand this out for consciousness in general, on Earth, both in its physical and non-physical forms, descends. Once it gets to the Kali Yuga, it is at its lowest, and is the Yuga we are currently in, in each of the three methods that I'll be talking about. So at least there's that point of agreement. But on the bright side, this Kali Yuga is also a very short one. And that's not all. There are even bigger cycles of time in Vedic cosmology. For example, there are 71 yuga cycles within what's called a Manvantara, which is the age of Manu. And according to this outlandishly long method of counting, it lasts 306 million 720,000 years. And then there's also 1,000 yuga cycles in a kalpa, which is a day of Brahma, translated here as 4 billion 320 million years, basically about the same age as planet Earth. And then, get this, according to this counting method, the largest cycle is called the Brahma Ratra and is 3 trillion 110 billion 400 million years long. So you can also calculate the yugas in a way that matches them up with the precession of the equinox, which lasts 25,920 years according to the zodiac. One degree of the zodiac takes 72 years, with there being 360 degrees to form a full circle. Half of the journey is a descent, taking 12,960 years, going through all of the four yugas. The ascent also goes through them all, taking another 12,960 years leading to the completion of a full 25,920 year cycle. Going by this method of counting the, how long the yugas are, you have the Satya Yuga being 5,184 years long, the Treta Yuga being 3,888 years long, the Dvapara Yuga being 2,592 years long, and the Kali Yuga coming in last at 1,296 years long. So as you can see, there's also a diminishing length of each yuga as you descend. According to Sadhguru, Krishna supposedly died in 3,192 BCE, and the Kali Yuga began a few months after that. That means we are not actually in the Kali Yuga at all anymore, according to him, but instead are in the Dvapara Yuga and moving into the Treta Yuga in 2082. That means that if this method of counting the Yugas is correct, most of you watching this are still going to be around that time. It also means we are continually ascending and evolving in consciousness as we move forward into our local future present. Now, I'm going to focus the most amount of time on the third way of calculating the yugas. And this is a simpler way, and the way that is the oldest, according to the ancient texts that we still have available to us today. Each yuga is split up into 3,000 earth years, including the times of transitions between the yugas, and that leads to a clean 12,000 year ascent and 12,000 year descent, totaling 24,000 years for the entire yuga cycle, ascent and descent. And according to what is being considered the original yuga cycle doctrine, which is the Saptarsi calendar, which has been used for thousands of years in India, the core of each yuga is 2,700 years long, with an additional 300 years being the transition period. According to this way of measuring the yuga cycles, we are emerging out of the ascending dawn of the Kali Yuga and finally transitioning into the Dvapada Yuga in 2025. 
Now that is not too far off at all. And then Earth will be fully in the Dvapada Yuga in 2325. So basically, this means we will not be fully out of the Kali Yuga and immersed in the tumultuous yet improving time of transition for the following 300 years. In a way, you could say that the most challenging part of the 24,000 year cycle will be over in 2025. Now the interesting thing about this third method is that there is actually corroboration with other counting methods of cycles of time in other cultures. The Zoroastrians, Greeks, and others saw cycles of time as being 12,000 years in length, which further corroborates what the oldest Vedic texts say. Even the Old Testament of the Bible matches up with the end of the Dvapada Yuga and the beginning of the transition into the Kali Yuga. Based on the genealogies written about there, the world was created in 4004 BCE, which is exactly matching the time of the end of the Dvapada Yuga is said to have occurred in the Saptarsi calendar, which is the one that's still used today. According to what the ancient texts say, the transition periods that occur between yugas are always connected to worldwide collapses of civilizations that existed, along with there being massive environmental catastrophes. These transition periods are the true Great Reset. The new world that emerges during these times of transition is guided by way-showers, luminaries, sages, wisdom keepers, and other consciously evolved and intelligent beings who hold with them technical and spiritual knowledge from the previous age that help humanity start fresh and anew. The parallels can also be found in the Jewish calendar, which begins in 3761 BCE. It's really fascinating that the Yuga cycles and other Vedic cycles are as long as they are from where we stand here on Earth, we are about 25,000 light years from the galactic center of the Milky Way galaxy. As the sun flies around it in an ellipse, it makes a single revolution once every 250 million years or around that. This can be considered one of the macro cycles that contain numerous smaller cycles within it. And you can consider those smaller cycles to be the Yuga cycle. I want to also tie the Yuga cycle in with the Mayan long count calendar, which is one of the three calendars that the Mayans used. The cycle lasts for 5,125 solar years. With that cycle, there are 13 baktuns, and each baktun is 144,000 days, which is around 400 years. The end date of December 21st, 2012, was written as 13.0.0.0.0 in the Mayan long count calendar. That marked the end of the time cycle and a new cycle began. Mayans used even larger units of time, which indicated they understood there were even larger cycles in time beyond 5,125 years. So how does this tie into the Yuga cycle? Well, the Kali Yuga is said to have started in 3102 BCE, or thereabouts. The end of the massive and advanced battle spoken about in the Mahabharata was at the cusp of the darkest time within the Yuga cycle. Interestingly, this is very close to when the great cycle of the Mayan long count is considered to have been, which is 3114 BCE. There's some also interesting correlations between the Yuga cycle and what happened in the geological record. You can actually match up the end of the last ice age with the end of a previous Yuga according to the third method of counting how long the Yuga cycles are. In 2012, scientists discovered that there was a massive, what looked to be a comet bombardment of Earth 12,000 years ago. This ended the Ice Age and destroyed much of the ancient global civilization that existed, along with megafauna and megaflora. This period of time lines up exactly within the 300-year transition period that marked the end of the Golden Age, spanning from 
9976 BCE to 9676 BCE. So you can see that's at least one example of an actual event of cataclysmic proportions occurring during the tumultuous 300-year transition period. So let's talk a little bit more about the Kali Yuga before getting into some really interesting correlations. The Mahabharata describes the Kali Yuga, which we are still in for a few more years, as the period when the world soul, or we can say collective consciousness, is darkest in its hue. It's when only a quarter of virtue remains, which slowly dwindles down to zero at the end of the Kali Yuga. The Mahabharata tells us that people turn to wickedness, there's a lot of disease, people are lazy or apathetic, there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of natural calamities and disasters, anguish and scarcity or fear of scarcity dominate the consciousness. Things like penance, sacrifices, and even religious observances, i.e. going to church, all fall into disuse, are no longer that used. And it even says in the Mahabharata that all creatures degenerate, which you can look at if you want to look at it in today's terms. Species are sicker, they're going extinct, they're having all sorts of issues, and today we can connect that with environmental pollutants and such. But it seems to be something that occurs with every Kali Yuga. Change passes over all things without exception because it's just a type of energy, right? And nothing can escape the effect of the energy that is going through the planet during those times. So during the Kali Yuga, when goodness and virtue have all but disappeared from the world, it may seem dark, but remember, it is the darkest before the dawn, and that dawn is quite literally a few years away. And even so, we would even say that the darkest has already been in our past, because as I mentioned earlier, we are in the ascending part of the Kali Yuga, because each Yuga or I should say the Kali Yuga, since it's at the very bottom of the cycle, there was still a descent into it for half of that Yuga cycle, and then we're in an ascension since several hundred years ago. And ever since then, things have been overall getting better, but now that we're coming up to this transition period, we're coming into a moment where there's a lot of shifts. So there's going to be a lot of good things happening and a lot of bad things happening. It's going to be highs and lows, highs and lows for the next 300 years if we're going to go by the Yuga cycle. As far as like the dates of when the Yuga cycle for the Kali Yuga started, the most accepted date is 3102 BCE. And that was 35 years after the conclusion of the Battle of the Mahabharata, which is an epic battle that I could talk a lot about. But for now, we'll just say, let's go with 3102 BCE. Great. That's when the Kali Yuga started. It makes sense. That was also a tumultuous time. And the reason why this date is picked is because a noted astronomer called Aryabhata in the Sanskrit text Arayabhatiya, or Arayabhataya, said that when 60 times 60 years, meaning 3,600 years, and three-quarter yugas had elapsed, 23 years had then passed since my birth. This is what Arayabhata apparently said. This means that Arayabhata had composed the text when he was just 23 years old and 3,600 years of the current yuga had elapsed. So there's a problem with this. The problem 
is that we don't even know when Aryabhata was born or when he composed the Aryabhataya. He doesn't even mention the Kali Yuga by name and he just states that 3600 years of the current Yuga at the time had elapsed. Now, scholars generally assume that the Kali Yuga had started in 3102 BCE and then use that statement I read to justify that the Aryabhataya was composed in 499 CE. However, we cannot use the reverse logic, meaning we can't say that the Kali Yuga must have started in 3102 BCE since the Aryabhataya was composed in 499 CE and we don't know when Aryabhata lived or completed his work. In India, around 500 CE, there was a major review of the Indian calendric systems, and it was during this time that Aryabhata identified the beginning date of 3102 for what we assume is the Kali Yuga, or at least what scholars were assuming was the Kali Yuga. Why would there have to be a sudden recalculation of dates that should have been an integral part of their calendric systems up until that point. It's something we'll look at a little later. So how did Aryabhata come up with the dates that he came up with? Well, it's generally believed that he calculated the start of the Kali Yuga on the basis of the information in the Sanskrit astronomical treatise called the Surya Siddhanta. According to that, there are five geocentric planets meaning those visible to the naked eye. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And they were aligned to zero degrees Aries near the star Zeta Piscium at the beginning of the Kali Yuga. Aryabhata arrived at the date of 17 or 18th of February, 3102 BCE, as being the starting point of the Kali Yuga. However, Modern simulations carried out by Richard Thompson show that on the 17th or 18th of February 3102 BCE, the five geocentric planets occupied an arc of roughly 42 degrees in the sky and were scattered over three zodiac signs, which are Pisces, Aries, and Aquarius. We simply can't consider this to be a conjunction by any means. However, far more spectacular alignments of planets have occurred in the preceding and succeeding centuries. So basically, the conjunction of geocentric planets at zero degrees of Aries that was supposedly targeted by Aryabhata did not take place in 3102 BCE. Does this mean that he made an error in his calculations? Well, not really. The Surya Siddhanta doesn't even specify that such an alignment of the planets took place at the beginning of the Kali Yuga. Quite the opposite. The Surya Siddhanta explicitly states that this conjunction of the planets at zero degrees Aries takes place at the end of the Golden Age. The text actually states, Now, at the end of the Golden Age, all the planets, by their mean motion, accepting however their nodes and upsides, are in conjunction in the first of Aries. Unfortunately, however, this simple statement was misrepresented by some of the early commentators in their eagerness to find an astronomical rationale for the 3102 BCE date. And then since then, it's just been considered a fact, which in reality, it's very far from that. There can be no doubt that the 3102 BCE date for the Kali Yuga was not based on any information in the Surya Siddhanta or any other Sanskrit text. This date virtually pops out of nowhere. And before 500 CE, this date was not even mentioned in any Sanskrit text. From where then did Aryabhata obtain this date, right? Well, there seems to be no indication that Aryabhata had computed this date himself. There is a single stray reference to this date in the Sanskrit text, the Aryabhataya, when he was 23 years old. And that's why since Aryabhataya was composed in 499, 
the beginning of the Kali Yuga can be traced back to 3102 BCE, according to that. The statement by itself doesn't reveal any information about the astronomical basis on which the date was calculated, or whether the calculation was performed by Aryabhata himself. It's possible that this date was adopted by Aryabhata from some other source that we don't even know about, and the vagueness surrounding the origin of this date makes its validity highly questionable. So you can see, even with this one example, it's been really difficult to pinpoint when exactly the Kali Yuga cycle begins so that we can get an understanding of when it ends. In many Sanskrit texts, the 12,000 year duration of the Yuga cycle was artificially inflated to ridiculously high values like I showed you in the first example of how to count the Yuga cycles. And this happened because they were multiplied by a factor of 360. However, certain texts like the Mahabharata and the Laws of Manu still retain the original value of the Yuga cycle as 12,000 years, period. Many other ancient cultures believed in the 12,000 year cycle of the ages as well. And according to the renowned Sanskrit scholar B.G. Tilak, in his book The Arctic Home in the Vedas, we get some insight as to perhaps why these dates, these years were artificially inflated so much. He says that the writers of the Puranas, many of which appear to have been written during the first few centuries of the Christian era, were naturally unwilling to believe that the Kali Yuga had passed away. An attempt was made, therefore, to extend the duration of the Kali Yuga by converting 1,000 or 1,200 ordinary human years into as many divine years, a single divine year, or a year of the gods, being equal to 360 human years. This solution of the difficulty was universally adopted and a Kali of 1,200 ordinary years was at once changed by this ingenious artifice into a magnificent cycle of as many divine or 360 times 1,200 equals 432,000 ordinary years. Someone else by the name of Yudkeswar also clarified in his book The Holy Science that a complete Yuga cycle takes 24,000 years and is comprised of an ascending cycle of 12,000 years, when virtue gradually increases, and a descending cycle of another 12,000 years, in which virtue gradually decreases. So, after we complete a 12,000 year descending cycle from Satya Yuga to Kali Yuga, the sequence then reverses itself, and an ascending cycle of 12,000 years begins, which goes from Kali Yuga to Satya Yuga which is where we are right now. We're in that process of going from the Kali Yuga upwards to the Satya Yuga. Yuktsuar states, each of these periods of 12,000 years brings a complete change, both externally in the material world and internally in the intellectual or electric world, and is called one of the Daiva Yugas or electric couple. The 24,000 year duration of the complete Yuga cycle closely approximates the processional year of 25,765 years, which is the amount of time it takes by the sun to precess or move backwards through the 12 zodiac constellations. Now interestingly, the Surya Siddhanta specifies a value of 54 arc seconds per year for precession against the current value of 50.29 arc seconds per year. So what does this mean? Well, this translates into a precessional year not being 25,765 years, but being exactly 24,000 years. This raises the possibility that the current observed value of precession may actually be a temporary deviation 
from the mean of 24,000 years. And that's where things get really interesting. The concept of an ascending and descending cycle of yugas, 12,000 years each, is not a proposition that Yuktswar conjured up out of thin air. It's actually something that the Jains in India, one of the oldest religious sects of the country, still believe. They believe that a complete time cycle, which they call a Kala Chakra, has a progressive and regressive half. The ancient Greeks also believed in ascending and descending cycles of ages. The Greek poet Hesiod, who lived between 750 BCE and 650 BCE, gave an account of the world ages in his works and days. And in that writing, he inserted a fifth age called the Age of Heroes between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. In Hesiod's Cosmos, Jenny Strauss Clay writes that, drawing on the myth of Plato's statesman, Vernant also claimed that the temporal framework of Hesiodic myth, that is, the succession of races, is not linear but cyclical. At the end of the Age of Iron, which he divides into two, the cycle of races starts again, and a new golden age, or more likely a new age of heroes, as the sequence reverses itself. Vernot himself offers a solution when he remarks that there is not in reality one age of iron, but two types of human existence. This is really interesting because he clearly believes that the cycle of the ages reverses itself. Not only that, but he states that the iron age has two parts, which corresponds exactly to Yuktswar's interpretation in which the descending Kali Yuga is followed by an ascending Kali Yuga. Based on this, the Age of Heroes, as it's called, which immediately followed the Bronze Age in Hesiod's account, must be the same name ascribed by Hesiod to the descending Kali Yuga. The evidence from different sources supports the notion of a complete Yuga cycle of 24,000 years comprised of an ascending and descending cycle of 12,000 years each. The whole idea of yuga cycles being progressively shorter in length, like the first method and even the second method from Sadhguru, isn't really founded in what are the oldest texts in the Vedic literature. And also the Zoroastrians, believe the world lasts for 12,000 years and is divided into four equal ages of 3,000 years each. Those Sanskrit texts which don't divide up the ages, the yugas, into exactly the same amounts of time deviate from the norm and from the most ancient texts that we have. What else is interesting and in that this sort of arithmetic progression is rarely, if ever, found in natural cycles. And so the seemingly unnatural sequence raises the question whether the yuga durations were deliberately altered at some point in the past in order to give the impression that the duration of each yuga decreases in tandem with the decrease in virtue from one yuga to the next. Two of the most famous astronomers of ancient India, namely Aryabhata and Paulisa, both believed that the yuga cycle is comprised of yugas of equal duration. The fact that Aryabhata believed the four yugas to be of equal duration is extremely pertinent to this. The Kali Yuga has 3,000 years, and that means that each other yuga is also 3,000 years, totaling 9,000, which would give us 12,000 years. However, he didn't just come up with this out of thin air either, but he must have had access to other sources, maybe some that are even lost to us now. There was people who held contradictory views to these astronomers in the past in India, like Brahmagupta, and they railed against Aryabhata and other astronomers who had differing opinions and even abused them verbally. Usually, if someone is going to those types of lengths and attacks, 
it means that they don't have ground to stand on. And sure enough, it doesn't seem like the 4-3-2-1 sequence that people like Brahmagupta came up with has any merit or validity in the natural world or otherwise. The original Yuga Cycle doctrine appears to have been very simple. A Yuga Cycle duration is 12,000 years old, with each Yuga lasting for 3,000 years. The Saptarasi calendar has been used in India for thousands of years and was used extensively during the 4th century BC and is still even used in some parts of India. The term Saptarsi refers to the seven rishis, or seven sages, who are represented by the seven stars of the Great Bear constellation, or Ursa Major. They are regarded as the enlightened rishis who appear at the beginning of every yuga to spread the laws of civilization. The Saptarsi calendar used in India had a cycle of 2700 years, and it's said that the Great Bear constellation stays for a hundred years in each of the 27 nakshatras, which are lunar asterisms. And this adds up to a cycle of 2700 years. The 2700 year cycle was referred to as a Saptarsi era or Saptarsi Yuga. If the 2700 year cycle of the Saptarsi calendar represents the actual duration of a Yuga, then the remaining 300 years out of the total yuga duration of 3,000 years represents a tenth of the yuga duration, automatically represents the transitional period before the qualities of the subsequent yuga are fully manifested. And this intervening period can be broken up into two separate periods of 150 years each, one occurring at the beginning of the yuga, known as Sandhya, or the dawn, and the other at its termination, known as Sandhyansa, or twilight. The total duration of the Yuga cycle, excluding the transitional periods, is equal to 10,800 years, which you get by multiplying 2,700 by 4. And this is the same as the duration of the great year of Heraclitus in the Hellenic tradition. How interesting is that? another confirmation from another civilization. It's agreed by historians today that the Saptarsi calendar that was in use during the 4th century BC started in 6676 BCE. In the book Traditions of the Seven Rishis, Dr. J. E. Michener confirms this when he says, we may conclude that the older and original version of the era of the seven rishis commenced in 6676 BC. This version was in use in northern India from at least the 4th century BC, as witnessed by the statements of Greek and Roman writers. It was also the version used by Vridagarja around the time of the start of the Christian era. The chronology of Indian kings goes back further than 6676 BCE, as documented by the Greek and Roman historians Pliny and Arian. Pliny states that from Father Liber, meaning Roman Bacchus or Greek Dionysus, to Alexander the Great, around 323 BCE, Indians reckon 154 kings and they reckon 6451 years and three months. Aryan puts 153 kings and 6462 years between Dionysus and Sandrakatos, to whose court a Greek embassy was sent in 314 BCE. Both indications add up to a date of roughly 66, excuse me, 67, 76 BCE, which is 100 years prior to the beginning of the Saptarsi calendar in 66, 76 BCE. It's obvious from the accounts of Pliny and Arian that they must have identified a specific king in the Indian's king list who corresponded to the Greek Dionysus or Roman Bacchus and whose reign had ended at around 67, 76 BCE. Who could it have been? According to the renowned scholar Sir William Jones, 
Dionysus or Bacchus was none other than the Indian monarch Rama. In his essay on the gods of Greece, Italy, and India, Sir William Jones deems Rama to be the same as Dionysus, who is said to have conquered India with an army of satyrs commanded by Pan, and Rama was also a mighty conqueror and had an army of large monkeys or satyrs commanded by Hanuman, son of Pavan. Rama is also found in other points to resemble the Indian Bacchus. Sir William Jones also points out that Meros is said by the Greeks to have been a mountain in India on which their Dionysus was born and that Meru is also a mountain near the city of Naishada or Nysa called by the Greek geographers Dionysopolis and universally celebrated in the Sanskrit poems. So there's an interesting Greek connection here. Both Pliny and Arian were aware of these associations. Pliny had placed the Dionysian satyrs in the tropical mountains of India, while we learn from Arian that the worship of Bacchus or Dionysus was common in India and that his votaries or devotees observed a number of rites similar to those of Greece. On this account, when Alexander entered India, the natives considered the Greeks as belonging to the same family with themselves. And when the people of Nysa sent the principal person of their city to solicit their freedom from the Greek conqueror, they conjured him by the well-known name of Dionysus as the most effective mean of obtaining their purpose. The identification of Dionysus with Rama provides us with a fresh perspective. According to the Indian tradition, Rama had lived towards the end of the Treta Yuga, or the Silver Age, which comes right after the Golden Age. And the Dwapara Yuga, which is the Bronze Age, had started soon after his demise. This implies that the 6676 BC date for the beginning of the Saptarsi calendar, which is 100 years after Dionysus, aka Rama, indicates the beginning of the Dwapara Yuga in the descending cycle. A later Saptarsi calendar, still in use in India, began from 3076 BCE. But, as Dr. Subhash Kak points out, the new count that goes back to 3076 BCE was started later to make it as close to the start of the Kali era as possible. Since the Dwapara Yuga immediately precedes the Kali Yuga, when you're going in the descending cycle, we're led to the conclusion that the Saptarsi calendar with a start date of 6676 BCE was counting time from the Dwapara Yuga. We also know that the Saptarsi calendar used during the what's called the Mauryan period was used for tracking the genealogical records of the Mahabharata war kings. Since the Mahabharata describes events that transpired in the Dwapara Yuga, there cannot be any doubt that the Saptarsi cycle beginning 6676 BCE marks the beginning of the descending Dwapara Yuga. If we use this date as an anchor point and the Saptarsi calendar as the basis for the Yuga cycle durations, meaning 2700 years with a transition period of 300 years, then finally the entire timeline of the Yuga cycle gets unraveled. So here's what it looks like. You have the descending Satya Yuga beginning at 12676 BCE and ending in 9976 BCE, 2700 years duration. In between the Satya Yuga and the Treta Yuga, you have a 300 year transition period between 9976 BCE and 9676 BCE. Following that, the Silver Age, Treta Yuga, 
goes on from 9676 BCE to 6976 BCE, also lasting 2700 years. The next transition period after that goes from 6976 BCE to 6676 BCE. After that, we come into the descending Dwapara Yuga, or the Bronze Age, and this is our anchor point. So 6676 BCE, lasting till 3976 BCE. After that, the transition period between the Dwapara Yuga and the Kali Yuga begins, and that goes from 3976 BCE to 3676 BCE. And then finally, you have the darkest and lowest point of the entire Yuga cycle, the descending Kali Yuga, Iron Age, beginning in 3676 BCE and lasting up until 976 BCE. That period, 976 BCE, is the lowest of the low that you can get within the entire Yuga cycle. You can consider that the darkest age. And then, after that, starts getting better, although very bumpy, for sure. Transition period, 300 years, 976 BCE to 676 BCE. Finally, after that, things are getting a little rosier. We're going into the ascending Kali Yuga, and that begins in 676 BCE and ends in 2025 CE just four years away, not even. After that, we shift into the 300-year transition period between the ascending Kali Yuga and the ascending Dwapara Yuga from 2025 to 2035. So according to this Yuga cycle timeline, the beginning of the Golden Age in 12676 BCE occurred more than 14,500 years before the present day. This timeline also indicates that the ascending Kali Yuga, which is the current epoch in which we are living in, is going to end finally in 2025. The full manifestation of the next Yuga isn't going to happen until 2325, but it will happen, and after that, you're gonna have two more Yugas the Ascending Treta and Ascending Satya Yugas, which will complete the 12,000 year ascension cycle. I wanna now go over the archeological and historic evidence that backs up that this is in fact the correct way to calculate the Yugas. According to the Yuga Cycle Doctrine, the transitional periods between yugas are always associated with a worldwide collapse of civilizations and severe environmental catastrophes, which wipe out virtually every trace of any human civilization. And sure enough, look around you on the planet. There is not a lot of historical evidence of past civilizations because A, they're underwater, given the sea rises, and B, there was a lot of destruction, a lot, throughout multiple complete yuga cycles throughout hundreds of thousands of years. The new civilization that emerges in the new yuga is guided by a few survivors of the cataclysm who carry with them the technical and spiritual knowledge of the previous epoch. Many ancient sources tell us of the enigmatic group of seven sages who are said to appear at the beginning of every yuga, which means within a few years, if these are actual beings of some kind. And then these beings promulgate or dispense, share, inform, teach the arts of civilization. We find these beings in myths from across the world, everywhere from Sumeria to India to Polynesia to South and North America. They possessed immense wisdom and power, could travel over land and water, and took on various forms at will. Were they the survivors of the previous yugas, or were they visitors from beyond Earth, or both? It's hard to say. And there's a lot of different opinions and perspectives and information, 
but we can't discard either option without proper scrutiny. But in any case, the main point is that the transitional periods between yugas have to correlate with severe cataclysmic events that regularly impact our planet as reflected in the archaeological records. And I'm going to show you that the Yuga cycle timeline that I've proposed correlates with these catastrophic events with stunning accuracy. Also, the transitional periods can be directly correlated with dates recorded in various ancient calendars and traditions. The first transitional period in the 12,000 year descending Yuga cycle is the 300 year period at the end of the Golden Age from 9976 BCE to 9676 BCE. Interestingly, this is the time when the last ice age came to a sudden end. The climate became very warm very abruptly, and several large mammal species like woolly mammoths became extinct. There's been a number of scientific studies that show a devastating global flood occurred at around 9600 BCE. This lines up with a lot of different ancient traditions and legends. For example, in Timaeus, Plato talks about a mythical island of Atlantis, which was swallowed up by the sea in a single day and night of misfortune in 9600 BCE. This event has also been recorded in the flood myths of numerous ancient cultures all over the world, which almost uniformly talk about enormous walls of water that submerged the entire land to the highest mountaintops and was accompanied by heavy rain, fireballs from the sky, intense cold, and long periods of darkness. In the Indian tradition, this flood took place at the end of the Satya Yuga, or the Golden Age. The survivor of the Great Deluge was Manu, the progenitor of mankind, who was placed at the head of the genealogy of Indian kings. So what could have led to this sudden worldwide deluge that we have documented evidence of today? Archaeologist Bruce Mass of the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico had examined a sample of 175 flood myths from different cultures around the world and concluded that the environmental aspects described in these events, which also are consistent with the archaeological and geophysical data, could have only been precipitated by a destructive deep water oceanic comet impact. In 2008, a team of Danish geologists from the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen studied the ice core data from Greenland and concluded that the ice age ended exactly in 9703 BCE. Researcher Jorgen Peder Stefansson said that in the transition from the ice age to our current warm interglacial period, the climate shift is so sudden that it is as if a button was pressed. You've probably heard how woolly mammoths literally had uneaten flowers in their mouth when they were found dead. So this was an extremely sudden shift. More recently, in 2012, an international team of scientists concluded that the Earth was bombarded by a meteorite storm nearly 12,000 years ago which effectively ended the Ice Age and led to the end of a prehistoric civilization and the extinction of many animal species. It's also interesting to note that the 9703 BCE date for the sudden climate shift falls within the 300 year transition period at the end of the Golden Age, which means it provides us the first important validation of the Yuga Cycle timeline. The 300-year transition period between the Treta Yuga and the Dwapada Yuga also coincides with a significant environmental impact, which is called the Black Sea Catastrophe, which if you haven't heard of this is really interesting. It's been recently dated back to 6700 BCE. 
The Black Sea used to be a freshwater lake, believe it or not. That is, until the Mediterranean Sea, swollen with melted glacial waters, breached a natural dam and cut through the narrow Bosphorus Strait, catastrophically flooding the Black Sea. This raised the water levels of the Black Sea by several hundred feet, flooding over 60,000 square miles of land, and significantly expanded the Black Sea shoreline by around 30%. This event fundamentally changed the course of civilization in southeastern Europe and western Anatolia. Geologists Bill Ryan and Walter Pittman of the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory in New York who had first proposed the Black Sea catastrophe hypothesis, had gone to the extent of comparing it to Noah's flood. Similar major flooding events were taking place in many parts of the world, as massive glacial lakes, swelled by waters of the melting ice, breached their ice barriers and rushed into the surrounding areas. In his book Underworld, Graham Hancock describes some of these catastrophic events that ravaged the planet during the time. Sometime between 6900 BCE and 6200 BCE, the Laurentide ice sheet disintegrated in the Hudson Bay and an enormous quantity of glacial waters from the inland discharged into the Labrador Sea. This was possibly the single largest flood of the Quaternary period, which may have single-handedly raised global sea level by half a meter. The period between 7000 BCE and 6000 BCE was also characterized by the occurrences of gigantic earthquakes in Europe. In northern Sweden, some of these earthquakes caused waves on the ground, as it was called, 10 meters high, which are referred to as rock tsunamis now. It is possible that the global chain of cataclysmic events during this transitional period may have been triggered by a single underlying cause which we are yet to 100% confirm what that was. But it's looking very likely to have been a comet impact, fire and ice, maybe comet and meteorite impact, but something definitely triggered this event. The transitional period between the Dwapara Yuga and the Kali Yuga from 3976 BCE to 3676 BCE was once again marked by a series of environmental cataclysms. The exact nature of these still remains a mystery. However, in geology, it's referred to as the 5.9 kilo year event, and is considered to be one of the most intense aridification events during the Holocene period. It occurred around 3900 BCE, ending the Neolithic subpluvial and initiated the most recent desiccation of the Sahara Desert. At the same time, between 4000 BCE and 3500 BCE, the coastal plains of Sumer, ancient Sumer, experienced severe flooding, which was the local effect of a worldwide episode of rapid, relatively short-term flooding known as the Flandrian Transgression. And this had a significant impact not only along the shores of the Gulf, but in many other parts of Asia as well. The catastrophic flooding event led to the end of the Ubaid period in Mesopotamia and triggered a worldwide migration to river valleys. This transitional period between the Yugas is recorded in many ancient calendars, and we find a clustering of important dates around this epoch. For a very long time, there was a prevalent belief in the Western world that the world was created in 4004 BCE. Interestingly, this date is just 28 years before the end of the Dwapara Yuga and the beginning of the transition period. So if you think about it, it does make sense that a calendar in, based on the Old Testament would start around the end of the Dwapara Yuga and the beginning of a new age, the age of Kali. The Jewish religious calendar starting in 3761 BCE puts it square in the middle of the 300 year transition period between the Dwapara Yuga and the Kali Yuga. The famous Mahabharata war of the Indian subcontinent 
which took place during the transition period between the yugas as well, occurred 35 years before the beginning of the descending Kali Yuga and can now be dated to 3711 BCE. The Mahabharata mentions that the Dwapara Yuga ended and the Kali Yuga started as soon as Krishna died or left this world. And then the sea swelled up and submerged the island city of Dwarka, which was located off the coast of western India. Interestingly, this city was considered for a long time in modern history to be a myth, but it actually did exist. Because in 2002, the National Institute of Ocean Technology in India discovered two cities submerged in the Gulf of Cambay at a depth of 120 feet. These mysterious submerged cities were laid out in a grid, had towering walls, massive geometric buildings, and huge engineering works, including dams, and they stood entirely above water 7,000 years ago. Nearly 2,000 man-made artifacts were recovered from the sites so far, some of which have been carbon dated to between 6500 BCE and 7500 BCE, which places the existence of the city in the Dwapara Yuga. Moving over to ancient Greece, the descending Kali Yuga came to an end with the battle fought on the plains of Troy. The Yuga cycle timeline indicates that the 300 year transition period between the descending and ascending Kali Yuga extended from 976 BCE to 676 BCE, as I mentioned earlier. And really interestingly, this overlaps with the 300 year period from 1100 BCE to 800 BCE, which is referred to by historians as the Greek Dark Ages. So that darkest of the darkest time is actually corroborated in his historical record as an actual dark age. Archaeological evidence shows us that tremendous destruction came to the Greek Isles during those Greek Dark Ages. The great Mycenaean cities and palaces collapsed. Villages and towns were burned, destroyed, and abandoned. The population of the cities was reduced drastically, and there was widespread famine, and people lived in isolated and small settlements. The magnitude of these cataclysms in ancient Greece was so massive that they completely forgot the art of writing itself. And they had to completely relearn it from the Phoenicians in the 8th century. The ancient trade networks were disrupted and came to a grinding halt. You can say that humanity was as disconnected as ever. This wasn't just a collapse of the ancient Greek civilization. There was a worldwide collapse of civilizations during this period. The Hittites suffered severe disruption, and cities from Troy to Gaza were destroyed. Egypt also lost control over its kingdom during this time. The period from 1070 BCE to 664 BCE is known as the Third Intermediate Period of Egypt. And it was at this time that Egypt was overrun and ruled by foreign rulers. And there was political and social disintegration and chaos. Egypt was increasingly beset by a series of droughts, below normal flooding of the Nile, and famine. In India, the Indus Valley civilization finally came to an end around 1000 BCE. Catastrophe also struck the ancient Olmec civilization of Mesoamerica. The first Olmec center, San Lorenzo, was abandoned at around 900 BCE. A wholesale destruction of many San Lorenzo monuments also occurred in 950 BCE. And scholars believe that drastic environmental changes may have been responsible for this shift, with certain important rivers changing their course. 
Now again, we don't really know what may have triggered all these calamitous events. However, historians speculate about a combination of catastrophic climate events. Egyptian accounts tell us that something in the air prevented much sunlight from reaching the ground and also stopped global tree growth for almost two full decades until 1140 BCE. One proposed cause is the Hekla III eruption of the Hekla volcano in Iceland, but the dating of that event remains in dispute still. However, since the descending and ascending Kali Yuga are not so different in terms of their qualitative aspects, the level of devastation during this transitional period was perhaps not as severe as the previous one, as the result of which some aspects of civilization managed to survive. When the ascending Kali Yuga began in 676 BCE, much of the knowledge, traditions, and skills from the descending Kali Yuga were lost. In Greece, the construction of monumental architecture stopped. The cavalry was replaced by foot soldiers. Pottery styles were simplified. In India, the use of Sanskrit as a means of communication was replaced by the language of the common masses, which was Pali or Prakit. Knowledge of ancient scriptures, sciences, and arts had been all but forgotten. Possibly in response to this grave social crisis, a number of philosophers, sages, and prophets appeared at this time, rediscovering the lost wisdom and spreading it amongst the ignorant masses. Among these were Buddha in 623 BCE, Pythagoras in 570 BCE, Zoroaster in 600 BCE, and Mahavir Jain in 599 People BCE. People have pretty much had it at this point by all the calamities of the previous centuries that they began a vigorous attempt to finally document the ancient scriptures, which were until then transmitted in a purely oral fashion. It was in this grave social and cultural milieu that the Mayans recalculated and recalibrated their entire calendar system around 400 BCE. And a few centuries later, Aryabhata and others attempted to fix the beginnings of the Kali Yuga and figure out where it started. Such an effort would have been quite unnecessary if the cataclysms of the previous centuries had not disrupted the flow of the rich oral traditions. However, much of the knowledge from the previous era was irretrievably lost, unfortunately. For instance, the original Vedas were comprised of 1,180 sakas, or branches, of which only seven or eight exist now today. That's less than 1%. So imagine how much wisdom of the original Vedas has been lost. As a result, it's only natural to expect that even within the texts that were finally documented, various errors and omissions had crept in. The mistakes in the Yuga Cycle Doctrine were just some of them. The Yuga Cycle timeline that I proposed mirrors the worldwide environmental catastrophes that accompany the transition periods between Yugas. The four key transitional periods since the end of the Golden Age all had these massive catastrophes occur. Between 9976 BCE and 9676 BCE, you had the end of the last ice age, catastrophic global flooding in 9703 BCE that was possibly triggered by a comet impact. Then in 6976 BCE to 6676 BCE, you had the Black Sea catastrophe of 6700 BCE the Laurentide ice sheet disintegration, enormous earthquakes and glacial outburst flooding all over the world. Then between 3976 BCE and 3676 BCE, you had the 5.9 kilo year event of 3900 BCE, intense aridity in the Sahara, the Flandrian transgression resulting in widespread flooding and other things. Then between the Dwapara Yuga and the Kali Yuga, you had 
the environmental catastrophes and civilizational collapse during the Greek Dark Ages from 1100 BCE to 800 BCE. The recurring pattern of devastation is really clearly discernible in the archaeological records. It seems that every 2700 years, our planet is impacted by a series of cataclysmic events for a period of a few hundred years, which brings about a total or near collapse of civilizations across the world. In all the cases, however, we find that civilization restarts immediately after the period of destruction. In recent years, many independent historians and researchers have realized that the concept of a yuga cycle is a far better descriptor of ancient history than the model of linear progress that's still favored somehow by mainstream historians. Egyptologist John Anthony West once said in an article called Consider the Kali Yuga that since Egypt's old kingdom up until very recently, civilization has been going down, not up. Simple as that. We can follow that degenerative process physically in Egypt. It is written into the stones and it is unmistakable. The same tale is told in the mythologies and legends of virtually all other societies and civilizations the world over. Progress does not go in a straight line from primitive ancestors to smart old us with our bobblehead dolls and weapons of mass destruction, our traffic jams and our polluted seas, skies and lands. There is another and far more realistic way to view history. Plato talked about a cycle of ages, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, or dark age. A cycle, a waveform, not a straight line. A simple understanding is reflected by virtually all other ancient accounts. The best known and by far the most elaborately developed of these systems is the Hindu with its yuga cycle which corresponds to the platonic idea of four definable ages. After taking this really long journey with me, you can now see how evident it is that the Yuga cycle, the original one, was based on the Saptarsi calendar. It was 12,000 years in duration, comprised of four Yugas of equal duration of 2,700 years each, separated by transitional periods of 300 years each. The complete Yuga cycle of 24,000 years was comprised of an ascending and descending Yuga cycle which followed each other for eternity and still do, like the cycles of day and night. For the past 2,700 years, we have been evolving through the ascending Kali Yuga and this Yuga is coming to an end in 2025. The end of the Yuga will inevitably be followed by cataclysmic earth changes and civilization collapses, as is characteristic of these transition periods. Unless something radically departs from pretty much all historical record we have, that's just going to be the case. The Dwapara Yuga is fundamentally different from the Kali Yuga in its spiritual and material dimensions and can be gleaned from ancient texts.